We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Today, we're going to be talking about some hot new games that we learned about through Aw Shucks, an online board game convention that happened this past weekend. So to start, before we get into the games, how about we talk a bit about what Shucks is and who puts on Shucks? Aw Shucks is the digital version of the Shucks game convention that is held annually at the Vancouver Convention Center in Vancouver, BC, here in Canada. That name is short for Away Shucks, and it's a 100% free online convention sponsored by the folks at the Shut Up and Sit Down show. The first Aw Shucks was held October 2020 due to the physical con having to be cancelled that year for obvious reasons. Yep. This year, they decided to do two online cons with Aw Shucks Spring, which we missed, and an Aw Shucks Autumn, which is the con we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. As for Shut Up and Sit Down, I assume most people watching and listening to us have heard of them, but if not, this is a team of Canadian tabletop gaming content creators that are celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. They released their first video in 2011. Mm. Since that time, have grown to over 350,000 subscribers wow. and obviously have gotten big enough to have their own game convention. A convention big enough that most of the big name publishers get involved in and attend. Yeah, Shut Up and Sit Down is big. Uh, they are a big uh, name in the industry. They're well known um, and for good reason. They are literally the biggest board game YouTube channel out there. And this may surprise people, but they are quite a bit further along than even the Dice Tower. They have over 100,000 more followers than the Dice Tower does. Um, they have continued to have a big input on the board game industry. Like when you talk about the term influencer, well, they'd be definitely influencers. More people listen to them than anyone else. They, they are, at this point, I would say more influential than the entire Dice Tower team. They have a reach and impact we can only dream of. So now that we know what Aw Shucks is and learned a little bit about the people behind it, how about you share some thoughts on the con itself before we dive into some game yeah. info. So straight up, this was the best organized and most informative and useful online con I've attended. As usual, a lot of the con took place on a Discord channel, which was combined with a web page and live streams of demos and actual plays. The actual gameplay was done through either a mix of Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator, which nowadays is pretty common. Now, the one thing I didn't see were panels. I don't think they were missed. Like, I don't think they, that, that I missed them, and I don't think there were any. I don't think they did it because this is a con about learning and playing games. The Shucks Con itself is a board game playing convention. It's not a trade show. It's not a demo show. It's a get a bunch of gamers together and play games. And that's what this was as well. This was all about the games. Well, personally, panels are some of what I love most about mm -hmm. a con. It's good to see them not overreaching and focusing yeah. instead on what they know best and just doing it right. And I will also point out this was a board game convention very firmly. There was not any role-playing content whatsoever in anything I saw. There were no no d d no Paizo, right? So this was very much a board game convention. Now, while I didn't spend a lot of time on the Discord, it was well-organized, seemed very busy compared to other online cons I've been to and had your usual mix of rooms to play games in, places to get information, places to ask questions, and general chat areas broken up into different categories. Now, the website, which I totally plan to like screen share or at least give you a link, is now just a landing page where you need a password to get in. So I'm not quite sure why they pulled it so quickly, but this was the best virtual convention hall I've seen yet, far surpassing even Origins and Gen Con Online. Now, at the top, there was their Twitch stream embedded and embedded well enough you could chat and everything. It was a fully functional Twitch stream, logged you in with your Twitch account, was just as good as being on Twitch. That had their live broadcast going on through the day. Under that were a list of sponsors, and there were a lot. Again, I wish I had counted, counted them. I'm going to guess like 90. Like it was a lot. There were a lot of icons there. And then each sponsor, if you clicked on them, you were brought to their virtual con booth. And it was interesting because they were even divided up by halls. So instead of clicking on a sponsor, you could just click hall A and browse by scrolling down. Whereas if you clicked on a sponsor, it jumped right to their booth, whichever hall they're in. 
which I still find it odd that they did that for online. Like why even have hall format, but at least people are familiar with that. So the halls were actually tiers. Um, yes. So they were broken up into, you know, the gold sponsors and the bronze yeah, sponsors and silver sponsors. So once you clicked on a tier, you got, you know, your big advertisement, whatever the company wanted to put there, whatever they wanted to promote, you know, it'd say the company name and whatever their big game that was premiering underneath that were videos. Of course, the biggest, most clear video would be the shut up and sit down video for whatever this, this sponsor, whatever they're sponsoring. But then there were other videos too. Like you might have multiple shut up and sit down, or you'd have the dice tower or Rado or uh, Rodney Smith, how to place. Now it looked like that was it. But then I noticed there's tabs. If you went shop, it brought you to a US online store where you could buy the games. And 99% of these were direct to the actual uh, publisher. There was also, and this is awesome, but it's because of Canadian Con, a Canadian online store. Now, this was a Vancouver local store that shipped all over Canada. And I'm sure it's probably like a sponsor of the, they probably work with the Shucks people all the time, the Shut Up and Sit Down people. But it was just awesome to have a link to a Canadian online store during a virtual game convention. Um, included on these pages were any con deals or promos which some had, some didn't. It's, I'm sure it was up to the actual publisher. The next one, you could actually click demos, which gave you, and I don't know how they did it, a, a, an iframe or whatever, of their Discord, where you could see all their demos and literally log in with your Discord and sign up to do a demo right then on the same page, which I thought was really impressive. Next was an events tab that showed any of the special events going on. So when, what hours they were running demos, if you could watch live streams and anything else that was going on. And then there was also a link to the sponsor's personal web page and a couple other things mixed in here and there. Compared to the weird floating mesh of graphics that was the Gen Con thing two years ago or the completely non-existent coupon book because I think all they had this year at Gen Con or the origin like this was so much better like it actually kind of felt like walking a vendor hall like I was literally browsing I was scrolling through and looking for for logos I recognize and clicking to see what they offer and be like oh I don't recognize this logo what do these people have like I actually kind of felt like I was walking a vendor hall yeah and honestly it's really not hard to beat what these other cons <laughs> have done um specifically in the the vendor area yeah they have tried various things and failed miserably in managing the hall portion of mm -hmm. these cons whereas for some reason chucks the good old canadian guys just knocked it out of the yeah. park and from what i understand it was like matt did it like 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 the matt's the producer he's one of the two main posts on shucks he does all of their graphics i think he set all this up and i'm like okay matt did a better job than whoever gamma put in charge of origins online and whoever en world put like oh, i was blown away like like every con should use this format like go give the shucks guys money yep. to host your virtual hall it was amazing the only disadvantage was it wasn't obvious if you didn't click on any of those sponsors you could have totally missed all of this and I'll admit, the first time I looked at that page, I thought it was just a page to watch their Twitch stream with all their sponsors down below. It wasn't until I clicked on one of them, I realized this functionality was there. But like, that's so minor compared to how awesome it was. Now, the main place I spent my time on through the entire con was on Twitch, watching the various streams while I worked. Now, I will say this didn't go quite as planned for them. Um, while there were scheduled live events, and they were fairly far apart, like sometimes two to four hours apart, and they were fine. They worked great. No hitches, no problems. They were great. In between was supposed to be pre-recorded game demos. And Matt was having a terrible time getting him to work. And this I don't get. Like, he did so good on other stuff. And I'm like, I know we've run video on our streams. It doesn't seem hard. So I don't, I don't know what the complication was in the background. But it wasn't until midday Saturday that they figured out the problem. And even then, the audio was never in sync, which I got to admit, I found really annoying, especially watching a demo and having it. Now, it wasn't far enough. There was like a lag, but it was just enough that it was disconcerting. Yeah, sadly, as people who tune in to see us live at the top of each show know, online yeah. production is hard. And it sounds like they were spending so much time prepping this that they just didn't test out that one aspect yeah. of the production in advance well enough. But I'm sure it's one of those, like you use Streamlabs and whatever, you're just like, oh, this is just where I'll import a video yep. and, and not test it because like that should be an easy thing to do. <laughs> and it was funny because like you couldn't hear him, 
but he would write notes. He's like, I'm trying. And he would hold it in front of the camera. So like, it, he obviously had like an overlay going over top of things. There was obviously multiple cameras, but anyway, that was the one disappointment. So, okay. Uh, overall, it was well done. Like very well done. Um, this, this to me is what I want from an online con. Like in all aspects, I honestly can't think of anything right off the top of my head that I would change to improve, except like to fix their technical difficulties. Maybe make it obvious to click on the click on the links to visit the booth. That's all it needed at the top. Um, this blew away all other online gaming conventions and hey, publishers, Gamma, Gen Con people, whoever, take a look at this. Well, you can't, the website's down. So yeah, there's my complaint. Why, what, now, before the con, you need a password to go in. And I assumed it was some way for people to put their information in before the con launched. But once the con ended, it disappeared and now is. And maybe it's just they don't want to give free advertising to all these people now that the con's done. I don't know why, but I wish I could show it to you. I, I, this is the part that bugs me the most is I'm like, I want to get a hold of, I, I don't know who at Origins, who at Gamma and say, look at this before it goes away. This is the standard that I will now be holding every online convention. All right, well, enough about a con that's already done and over with and may or may not be back next year. Let's get to the games. What is it you learned about with all that streaming? Okay, these are in absolutely no order. Uh, well, they're in order that I saw them. So some of these were actual plays. Some of these were demos. So the demos were interesting because they were pre-production games where they gave the, the Shut Up and Sit Down team copies of the games they were very clear to say, these are not reviews. We are not sharing a how to play. Like, like these were not paid previews. They were, they were just, we were given the game and here's a script we follow to teach it to you kind of thing. So it was, it was, a, sorry, it was a paid, paid promo, but it wasn't, it wasn't a preview or a review. So that was kind of interesting. So it was basically just there to show it. Now the actual plays involved members of the shut up and sit down team playing games with either the designers or the publishers or both. So that was actually, those were fantastic because you actually got the designers there talking about stuff in that. Now, Pandasaurus was the biggest sponsor of the, the entire event. They, they were the big people pushing it. They're actually how I heard about this con was through newsletters from Pandasaurus, not from Shut Up and Sit Down. And the first game I watched was a game of Dinosaur World. So Dinosaur World is, of course, the latest Jurassic Park game from Pandasaurus Games, trying to follow the whole uh the, what do you call it uh the trend of the original right so they went from an island to a world while well, you have the world version now there was dinosaur island i'm pretty Which, sure panasaurus would be upset if you actually used jurassic park in their <laughs> well, i don't they think they're allowed to they <laughs> didn't but the the shut up and sit down people made that comment a couple times yes it is a jurassic park themed but not licensed game we'll put it that way yeah i and very much based on some of the things from the movies um so I own Dinosaur Island, and I'll admit I was a little disappointed by Dinosaur Island. Like, there's some great parts about it. There's some really neat stuff, but there's some things I didn't love. One of the things I don't like about Dinosaur Island is for how fiddly and long it is, it's really light. Like, it's, it's not a filler, but, like, it's just not that heavy a game. And it's mostly about getting lucky on your rolls for your... Um, your dna to get the right dinosaurs out but like every type of dinosaur at the different sizes are identical they all do the same thing the the various people whereas dinosaur world is way above it is a step above it is higher difficulty it is now a worker placement game the worker placement aspect is really cool so you start off in a simultaneous play phase where everyone's like buying upgrades for their parks this looks like suburbia. Like it really looks like suburbia. You are buying hexes. You're starting off with your visitor center and building out just like in suburbia, you're building down from your top bar. Um, and even some of the mechanics have to do with what things are put next to and how many people have in a park. There's obviously some inspiration here. So you're putting things in your park. Then you get to the turn phase and here's where it's worker placement. But I thought the worker placement was fascinating. You have your Jeep and you drive it to different parts of your park. Now the park is cheap. And they can't afford multiple Jeeps. So there's one Jeep to bring tourists. And it's also the Jeep that brings people to their jobs, which I thought was an amusing thing. So it's a whole thing about getting your workers to the right positions, as well as bringing people to the attractions you want them to see. Um, I, that's about all the detail I want to get into. This looks good. And I just, I feel bad for wanting it because I don't feel I got enough use out of Dinosaur Island but this looks so much better. This looks like a much better game for myself. I think Deanna would like it a lot better. Um, the components are actually even better. It has 
wooden meeple dinosaurs that actually look like the dinosaurs in the game instead of random plastic dinosaurs that don't actually match the cards. I got to say, Dinosaur World looks sweet. Um, I wish we were going to a con where Pandasaurus was so I could beg for a review copy. So interestingly, now this may be a Kickstarter issue. I don't know what's going to happen when when they actually hit first uh, retail printings, but I have seen a number of complaints about mistakes and uh, incorrect iconography Ow. and and some you know some some printing and manufacturing issues with mm. earlier at least Kickstarter versions of this game. That Ouch. being said, it's still rated a 7.8. It's got a That's solid good. medium, just over a medium weight. Uh, it's actually not rated weight-wise that much more than Dinosaur Island, okay. uh, but it is a little bit higher. Um, the One of the other com complaints I'm seeing is it's kind of solitaire, so, uh, a couple of rounds of solitaire, solitaire, but then you get one round where you're actually playing with other people, and then you're back yes. to solitaire again. And yeah, so, that was... It was explained that way too. Yeah. The simultaneous play phase where everyone's doing stuff and then you do turn based and you're each kind of moving your own, or it's the other way, right? The simultaneous, you're each kind of doing your own thing and then you interact. Yeah. I don't know. It looks, it looks pretty cool. I, I would love to do a demo of this. I'd love to review this. Hey, Pandasaurus, if you're listening, um, I, I just, I can't justify spending the money on it because I went all in on Dinosaur Island and I just feel like I need to get some more use of the game. I know sunk cost fallacy happening right there. You just heard it live. So my next game is, is one I, I can't say I'm hyped about, but I wanted to talk about because it's kind of a big deal. And that is Machi Koro 2 from Pandasaurus. Um, one important thing with Machi Koro 2 is there was a problematic issue with the first game that has been removed. So for anyone who is concerned about that, uh, Mr. Honeycutt did not work on Machi Koro 2 whatsoever. Now, of course, it would be kind of based on his work in the previous, but at least he's getting no money out of this. Now, this confused the heck out of me, and which is why I wanted to talk about it, is here I'm watching it, and they have, they changed the market. So one of the biggest changes is there's a variable market, but I own Bright Lights Big City, which was the Target exclusive that had a variable market, and, and like we played it. So I don't know, I guess. Only Bright Lights Big City had a variable market, so the version of Machi Koro I played is the only one that had it. I can't see playing the game without it. So I guess that's a big deal for people who don't have Bright Lights Big City, which again was a Target exclusive. The other thing that's really big in this one, and this I get, is normally in Machi Koro 2, it's all about building uh, monuments or something. Like everyone gets a set of buildings that are unique. They're not unique to them, but like everyone gets the same set of buildings. The game ends once you built them all. And these were all things that, that modify the gameplay, get you extra dice and stuff. Well, now these are unique. You don't all have the same monuments or whatever they're called. So I thought that sounded interesting, but overall, it's still Machi Koro. They didn't, it's still roll one die, add it together. When you unlock a second die, it's roll one or two dice. You choose to either roll one. If you roll two, you have to add them. Eventually, you unlock a third die, get lots and lots of money, and then lots of take that stuff that takes the money away from you. Your end goal is to build your five or six monuments. The difference is your monuments are different. Uh, my monuments are different than Sean's. I've got to say, it does sound like a progression from Manchi Koro, but I don't think it's going to win me away from Space Base or Valeria. Fair and enough. Pandasaurus, don't listen to that part now because I still want you to send Dinosaur World. Oh, fair, fair enough. We can't all love all the games. Yeah. All right, up next is a game called Four Gardens. This one is from Arcane Wonders, and uh, we tend to like games with table presence. This game wins for best table presence of the show. In the center of the table you build this plastic and cardboard pagoda that I think is four layers that has the whole peaked roof thing going on. Now, the neat part about the pagoda is you can turn sections of it. And on your turn, you get the stuff on the pagoda that's facing you. But you also know what all the others are because it's a blank, a one, a two, and a three. That's all it is. It's a way to track. You probably could have done it with dice, to be honest. But this is a way to do it. And the, the thing is, is it works like lanterns. So it's what, so you have to have your four players have to be each sitting opposite each other. So you get what faces you on the pagoda, which is the part I don't think you could just do with a set of dice. What you're doing with that stuff is you're using them to build panoramas. And here the game looks a lot like Takedo, where you are building these 
vistas of gardens that have multiple parts to them. And you're using the resources, you get off the, pan, the, the pagodas to buy cards, and then eventually you put all the resources in your cards, you flip them over and try to build panoramas. Now, this was a very short, um, sorry, it was an actual play, but I didn't catch all of it. Um, a mix of technical difficulties, the fact I was working. So I can't really tell you more than that. But I got to say the pagoda looked really neat. And the combination of getting, I, I love lanterns for that whole, I put down a tile and I got to get what I want and make sure you don't get what you need. So it's all about turning the pagoda. So I get the good stuff, but I don't help other players. I love that in lanterns and it looked just as cool in this. And I liked the Zen nature and the artwork. The artwork again, reminded me of Tokaido. The artwork for those panoramas looks amazing. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of great things to say about this. My initial concern when I first when when Mo first uh, showed this one to me was this tower and the longevity and storage and this. But the more you look into it, they've really taken a step to look and think about not only the storage but mm -hmm. how to reinforce the cardboard to make it last longer, to make it not you know damage itself as you're rotating these pieces. Mm -hmm. They really seem to have done a fantastic job with what could be a very brittle and problematic mm -hmm. centerpiece. Yeah, and the one thing we were able to confirm during the live stream is it just goes back in the box as it is. Like once it's assembled, it gets stored that way, it comes out that way, which sounded awesome. Mm -hmm. Next is City of the Great Machine, which happens to be from our sponsor, Crowd Games. So the thing here is, is the Great Machine is the man it is it is a city a clockwork city with all these gears and it's a dictatorship and the city provides for everyone and it's very much a a dystopia you are playing steampunk revolutionaries trying to fight against this establishment and disrupt the great machine so you have a bunch of districts there are map tiles that are built with six things and the whole thing is the city the machine is floating because you got to get airships in with your steampunk, right? That's kind of a thing ever since Abney Park. You don't have a choice. You just have to. You have to wear brown. You have to have goggles. You have to have airships and gears. So the cool part is you build this map with different districts, and they can be moved around. Now, this is a blind movement game, and it, it was originally sold to me as a one versus many game, but it's more of a, a DM style role. It's more of the, the Empire in Imperial Assault than Dracula and Fury of Dracula. Because the people who are moving blind are the players, whereas the establishment is the one who doesn't know where they're going. They're trying to do things. So everyone has card-based movement where they basically put down a card saying which district they want to move to, and that's it for your hidden movement. Then the machine takes their turn. So then the machine starts moving guards around and they have these like really cool assassins that move around and they have the cyborg servants, sorry. They're cyborg servants, not assassins. And then they move everything and then the players reveal where they went, right? And then we see what happened and did they get caught and stuff like that. Now the machine, if they get their servants to six different boards can do different things. There's a whole system of getting to the, um, getting to the, the law building and then you can enact new laws. And if the rebels don't disrupt them, they go into play and change it, make things better. Um, one of the other things the servants can do is move the boards around. So if you know the players are trying to get, you know, from here to here, you can then rearrange the whole city. Uh, you can deny access to certain spots. When you get in a fight, instead of your character dying, you just get denied access to the area you were in when you were got caught. So they basically like, change your armband so you can't go there anymore, which limits where you're going to be able to go later. So then the person playing the machine now knows that player, well, has to remember, actually, that player can't go to that spot because I caught him. Um, there's a whole thing with discontent where you're trying to build discontent. It's on a big steampunk looking clock. And that's what the rebels are trying to do. And they start getting discontent and then more and more people of the city start joining you um there's some social commentary where the artists are the first to join your cause and eventually it keeps going and eventually you'll get the nobles to join your cause and if you are able to do it you then defeat the great machine this looks really good like like when i agreed to sponsor for crowd games we don't just accept any sponsorship i always look at the game it looks pretty solid it looks like it looks like something we'll enjoy i had no idea how much i would want this game until seeing this demo yeah, no, this, uh, the game, I don't think the game uh, shows on the table as well. Uh, like just looking through the pictures in the gallery uh, mm -hmm. on Board Game Geek shows you really fully what it's, it's capable of. 
Um, I think you really do need to either try the Tabletopia demo or see a live play of it to really get the mm -hmm. full experience of the City of the Great Machine. Next, I've got Tales of the Red Dragon Inn. So this is from Slugfest Games. And honestly, I totally thought this was just another Red Dragon Inn card game expansion because there, there are so many. I own something like 14 characters for that game, and I don't even think I own half of them. And I thought it was really weird when um fan of the show, Wilt Chamberlain, got a hold of me and was like, have you seen the Red Dragon Inn Kickstarter? And I literally said, I'm like, I don't care about Red Dragon Inn. Well, I suck because I should have checked it out because this is a dungeon crawl. So the entire theme of Red Dragon Inn is it's a, a beer and pretzels card game about a group of adventurers who just got back from the dungeon and are splitting up the treasure. And they're trying to drink it away and gamble it away. And you want to be the last person who hasn't passed out or gone broke. Well, this is the beforehand. This is the dungeon crawl. This is go what you did. This is what your characters did before they went to play Red Dragon Inn. The thing is, this looks like Gloomhaven. Like if you look at a map of it, you could swear it's Gloomhaven. It's hex based, there's tiles, there's counters. The monsters even kind of look like Gloomhaven monsters. There's hazardous terrain, all that stuff. But instead of being a heavy Euro thinking game, this is a light, silly game. This is a, you know, move as up to your movement and roll the attack dice and see if you get hits. Now, because it's Red Dragon Inn, you have, of course, all the characters that already existed. So you get to play your favorite characters from the game, including having the wizard with Pookie the bunny, his familiar. Now, it adds in the silliness, both from the type of abilities, but what they have is abilities called shenanigans. Every character has their own set of shenanigans that break the rules in some way. Now, this is one of those games with charred tokens, so you use your shenanigan again, and then it counts down before you can use it again. You're going to roll lots of dice. Um, this is an Ameritrash dungeon crawler, right? This is a hack and slash, chuck the dice, have a drink, have fun. This is even lighter than Descent. Now, at this point, I have no idea when this game's coming. Um, they have been trying to get prototypes for six months and still have not gotten a physical copy. So they made the most impressive tabletop simulator version of game I've ever seen. Like this is, it looks like 3D, like I'm playing a game. If you are tired of grim, dark dungeon crawling and want something light and fun, I think Red Dragon Inn may be up your alley. Yeah, unfortunately, currently it's listed as 2023 yeah, on Board like Game Yeah, like I said, there are... We're, we are so about the new hotness. We're two <laughs> years ahead of time on this one. Absolutely. Uh, it definitely does look like interesting. But again, you uh, the only thing we're looking at is digital versions. Yeah, so that's all that exists. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say for sure. All right. Next, I've got Brian Boru, High King of Ireland. This is from Osprey Games. Osprey used to be a place that wrote military history books and now does board games um, and, and card games. And I have to mention this because it did a mashup that I have never heard of before that sounds really neat. It's a trick-taking card game combined with folk on the map military or area control. This is Irish versus the Vikings. You are playing the Irish. The Vikings are like the AI that comes in and raids. But of course, the Irish don't get along themselves so you are fighting over territory you are taking territories on the map area control style through war diplomacy and of course befitting of the time period marriage um there are three suits only to the cards but there is technically a fourth that is a wild suit what happens is if you put your spot your token on a tower that starts a round of trick taking the color of the tower determines the lead suit the winner of the trick gets to own that tower then the owner of the trick gets the top, keep their card, but then the losers get their cards back. So like the winner who won the trick gets the tower, but then all the losers get whatever cards they played, which each do something. Like one of the cards is get married to someone, another is expand your forces, another is fight back the raiders. Trick taking with uh, dudes on a map, folk on a map, sorry. Trick taking with folk on a map. That alone makes me want to try this game. Yeah, this one, this one's interesting. And I'm, in, I'm I'm confused as to who did the entry for Board Game Geek because right now <laughs> the only mechanism listed is trick taking, despite the fact it's very clearly a map board that, that where yes. things are happening. It cannot possibly be just a trick taking game, oh. and yet there it is. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens. It is listed as 2021, but let's not believe that, folks, because yeah. this is pandemic times. Your best bet on this one may be going to Osprey's website. 
because I know there was a link to it in that virtual dealer hall where I could find more information on this game. And I did look at some pictures. But yeah, trick taking and folk on a map. That alone, I'm like, I like trick taking. I like folk on a map. Be beware though, this is not your regular low cost trick taking game as an Osprey publishing game. The MSRP in Canada is seventy four fifty. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, what I saw, there's a lot of wooden bits. Again, folk on a map, right? No yeah. minis, but but think of all your tokens and stuff going out on a map board. So there, there are 46 cards, 139 tokens, and 125 yeah. wooden discs in uh, this see, game. That does not sound unreasonable for 70 bucks. Yeah. All right. Next up, a, a Verdant from Flat Out Games. Um, artwork by Beth Sobel. So this is the, the woman who did Wingspan uh, and many other games fantastic art style and work for doing hyper realistic artwork well not hyper realistic i would say i wouldn't say hyper realistic this is a game that i think is going to be more zen than takaido this is all about building your own like um sunroom so you are collecting plants like like perennials and plants that have to go in the sun you are purchasing chairs and end tables and like a cat um you're basically making your own little greenhouse garden area um where the plants have to be placed next to something adjacent in your room um the other stuff like comfy chairs and fish tanks go in there um building you're trying to build the happiest room possible now, the objects have symbols on the edge to show how much shade they provide. So you have to make sure you put your shady plants in shade of the whatever the table or the blinds. And you need your full sun plants out in the center of the table where the light from the window comes in. Um, there's this neat mechanic where you can upgrade your pants by adding pots, where it actually gives you a token that you place over top of the card. So it now looks like the plants in a new pot. Um, I have no idea how good this is, but I love the theme. And it just seems so zen. And I love the fact that, like, you make your room happier by having a cat in it and stuff like that. This one just looks neat. Yeah, no, this one is very interesting. Um, there's bag building and there's a whole tableau uh, thing. And the cards are actually interlocked. The actual four sides of the cards have different light levels mm -hmm. and shade levels. And uh, the little the little fern meeple are, mm -hmm. are cute. Um, it's an interesting. I think that's the number of leaves that have grown on your plant, which shows to be how healthy they are. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There's there's a lot to it. Um, you know, I guess if you're a board gamer and a house plant enthusiast, this yeah. could be your game. Just like all the bird lovers have been uh, yeah. swamped with games that they love. <laughs> Next is cartographers from Thunderworks. So this is a flip and write. This is not new. So I don't, I watched an actual play of this. So what I'm guessing is they probably were playing with some new expansions coming. So I, I don't have a lot to say about this because I don't want to spoil anything that's supposed to be coming soon or I, I don't want to say anything that's not in the base game, right? Like I want to go, oh, this was an awesome mechanic and it ends up that's not actually in the base game. This is a game that's already on my wish list. Um, I need Tim to send me a copy of it. I've been talking to him about it. We were supposed to hook up at Origins. Didn't happen. Um, this is a fantasy game from the same group that brought you role player, the game where you roll up characters. It's set in the same universe. They've now started to build this fantasy universe. And what you're doing is making a fantasy realm. Technically, you're mapping the, the kingdom. This is done by flipping over a card that is going to show two up to two different terrain types and up to two different shapes. Usually a big shape that takes lots of room and a small shape. If you draw the small shape, you get some coins. Coins can be used to do stuff. Um, everyone plays off the same card. So I always enjoy games where you do that. You flip over the one card and everyone's got to draw whatever. It'll, it'll say something like Valley Stream and it'll show you can draw forest or river and it has to be whatever, you know, Tetris shapes. Right. It, along with this is a scoring that's open right from the beginning where you can see what the scoring is going to be. And you're trying to do stuff, right? Like connect up the ruins or have the longest forest or your biggest three by three city area and so on, right? The kind of stuff you expect to score in polyominoes. Um, what I thought was neat in this too is this was seasonal. Again, hopefully this is in the base game where you play through summer, spring, whatever. Well, you'll throw up a card and it'll say like spring six. Then you'll flip up the actual spring cards and they're numbered one to three. Well, you could pull, pull six ones before spring ends, or you could draw two threes before spring ends. So you never know when the seasons are going to end. This one just looks fantastic. 
again, I don't know if they were trying to show off something new coming or if just, you know, Thunderworks sponsored a, a, an actual play. So it what looks I, so good. So what I suspect is uh, in 2021, they released a Kickstarter Cartographer's Heroes Collector's Edition on Kickstarter. Okay, that's And probably. this contained both the cartographers, but also a custom plastic insert, three expansion map packs, and okay. a skill pack mini expansion, uh, as well as some colored pencils. So um, that there, that's probably what they're pushing right sense. now was this big collector's edition, which gave you all the content for cartographers okay. in one box. That makes sense. And I do think the maps they were using were not the base game ones, though. I don't know. Maybe ruins are on the base game. There are. Yeah, there are three, um, three new map packs that came out this okay. year. All right. Next, I've got Beast. This is from a company called Studio Midhall. This is a huge fantasy realm map. This is a table hog. It's going to take up a lot of room. This seems to be a new theme. I've seen a few games following this where you are playing medieval fantasy. You know, I didn't see any elves, but I definitely saw like barbarian and ranger type characters and a thief type character trying to catch the beast. Now, the beast is randomized. So in the actual play I watched was a giant hog called like Hogsmeade or something. Hogbad. Hogbad, thank you. Called Hogbad. And they were trying to catch Hogbad. This is the hidden movement game, the swap around. Like what I usually think, unlike City of the Great Machine, this is why I think of when I hear hidden movement, is a bunch of players trying to catch the one player. So the one player is playing the beast, moving around the board. What they're trying to do is eat farm animals and villagers which are all represented by anna meeples and meeples all over the board so the beast going around the map trying to eat people as it eats people it's um i forget the word animosity towards the characters goes up and as the characters attack them and that's how the beast levels up and every time and the same thing with the characters when they fight and lose their animosity goes up and that's a way to unlock new powers um this does a whole hidden movement thing but it's drafting and this sounds awesome. So you have a hidden movement game, right? Where most of them is like right down on a sheet of paper where you go. And then Fury of Dracula improved on that by playing cards face down on a table. So you can always go back and look at where you were. But what this does is drafting. So I get a hand of cards and I have to pick my move and then I pass to one of the other players and they got to pick their move. Well, someone also has to pass to the beast. So you may have an idea of what cards the beast has and where they might go. That sounded fantastic. The people playing this claimed this blew away um, Fury of Dracula. Like, like this set a new standard for hidden movement games. Jeff Seuss, if you're listening, I think you're really going to want to check this one out. Personally, I'm really curious. This sounds neat to me. And it seems to be the new thing, like b chasing the monster thing. I don't know if it's Monster Hunter, the video game series in popularity, what it is, but these seem to be coming up more often. I guess hey, the beast looks good. So I, now when you're saying looks good, I yeah. don't, you're, you're not really <laughs> like the art on this game mm -hmm. is fantastic. The art is by one of the designers, Aaron Midhall, who is, and I, I assume a, a brother or relative, Elon Midhall is the other designer. But uh, I just not only have gone through the images from the game, but I went and found Aaron Midhall's uh, Instagram page. Yep. And as an artist, his style is fantastic. Also got a couple of cute cats, but um but no, I, I have to say the artwork on this game is just captivating. So Ryan in our chat is saying, would rather play games from the monster's perspective? Well, you get to do it in the beast. Yep, you can is. play the beast. There you go. And all movements hidden for Ryan. <laughs> Next, I have Brick and Mortar. This is from Octograph, not Octograph, Octograph Games. This is a game about building brick and mortar stores non-online stores, independent businesses. S stores are represented by cards that look like the inside of the store, like you just walked in the door. Each has shelves that hold different goods. You're basically making a strip mall. They didn't call it this, but like your player board has a spot for four stores and you're putting stores in and you are going to rotate them as time goes on. Um, one of the things you have to do is pay for electricity bills, who gets what shops as an auction. Um, you can close down shops. And all shops give you something when they close. So this is another one of those games where um, someone asked this question the other day, games like um, Small World, 
where you put your things into like retirement, right? You play a thing for so long, then you go into decline. Well, this has that. Eventually, you're going to want to close your shops before people don't care about them anymore. It's basically strip mall landlord the game. Um, bonus points for unique theme. This is definitely an economic game. Um, when you're buying goods, it's a it's a bidding auction to who gets to go shop first. So whoever bids the most gets to buy product first and then whoever bids second only gets the leftovers but then they only pay what they bid so it's, it's not like an auction is in someone's going to get all five of these if there's five and i bid 10 i get first pick but maybe i only want one and i wanted to be sure whereas if sean bid five he could buy the rest for five each that's a great way to do it it simulates supply and demand well um the way selling works is how many you have to sell in the price but you get to set your own price like you literally sit back and Sean decides his goods are three and mine are five. And while people only want six, well, Sean's three go first and then three of mine. So that's really cool. Um, there is only so much demand every turn. I, it looks light and silly. Like the art style in this, I thought was going to be a nice quick. It, it reminded me of Foodies, if anyone's played that game or um, Networks Master is, Chef. Networks is what it reminds me of in some to some degree. Fair. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Now, what the shelves actually do is they show you how good your goods are. So when they're on the top shelf, they're they're fresh. And then when they hit the next shelf, they're not as good. And they can rot if they fall off. Um, one of the things I did, I don't know if I like it. I'd have to play it. That brings me back to Princes of Florence, an old Aaliyah game, is you would expect an economic game like this. Almost everyone I've ever played is at the end of the game, whoever has the most money wins. That's not the case here. Instead, you can buy points during the game. And then it's, do I buy points or do I save the money to make future investments? And when do I convert my money to points? You can also, if you need the money, sell your points, but it's not at the same value you bought them at. This looks like a significantly heavy economic game with a very approachable theme for a game like that. So yeah, it's, ra it's rating right now. And again, this is still early, but it's rating right now at a 3.17. So it's on the medium, yeah. you know, medium That's scale. Um, uh, and, uh, there are, is also already an expansion for additional stores out. So yeah, Kickstarter uh, stretch goal that was funded. Yeah. So you can get additional stores out there. It, it looks interesting. I have to say, um, I'm not a huge auction lover, but yeah. it, the, the theme of this and the way it's integrated and the, the number of mechanisms involved makes this look interesting. Yeah. Like to me, it, it seems like food chain magnet light. -like. Like very like compared to food chain magnet, but still not being simple. I know it really caught my eye. Like at first I was like, oh, it's this light game. And then they started teaching it. I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> so they did an actual play. It was an hour long. They got through two turns. Now that did involve the teach. So it just kind of goes to show that this was a heavier one. Next, I have Lizard Wizard from Forbidden Games. This is the follow-up to Raccoon Tycoon. Though it's only similar in the fact that they took a really solid kind of interesting card-based game and put animals in it to make it more appealing. Because Raccoon Tycoon is a solid economic game that they threw in raccoons to make it interesting. Um, this is a card-driven game where you're using auctions to recruit re wizards. Your wizards are going to recruit, get you reagents. You're going to use your wizards and your reagents to build wizard towers. You get bonus points for matching the right types of wizards to the right towers. You're going to collect spells. Um, you're going to cast the spells using your reagent reagents. All of the sil spells are silly. This goes with the whole lizard wizard theme and break the rules. What you're trying to do is like set collection and other elements. Think like Sushi Go, like each different type of wizard scores a different way than the other ones. Great artwork, neat theme. Um, they... In addition to this, there's a, a dungeon crawling aspect where you can push your luck, where you send your familiars into the dungeon to find you stuff, and you start flipping over cards from a deck, and it's like, oh, I found a gem, and then you decide, do you keep going, or do you flip again? And if you find a monster, your familiar retreats, and you get nothing. Just cute little mechanic to throw in there. Um, one of the things I thought was fantastic about this game that Ian would love, or one of our friendly local game store owners, is... All of the take that cards where you steal stuff from other players or, or hinder them in some way have a star on the card. And if you don't like playing take that, take them out of the game. I love that. Yeah, no, this is, uh, it's interesting. The game, it's, it's a very thematic art style. Mm -hmm. um, not particularly my taste, but it's very well done. Just not, doesn't, uh, doesn't do it for me, but it's a very nice art style. Uh, just, yeah. 
I'm uh, not to overall, your taste. Not to my taste, but no, it's I, again, yeah. I there there seems to be a whole lot of this. Let's take a board game and make it animal style. Yes, that's... right now, which is just kind of I, after a while, I, I kind of I guess I'm kind of burning out on that that Fair. twist on. It's not even retheming; it's just rearting almost. Yeah. It's, so. I don't know. I, I I think a lot of people are like it worked for Root. We got the world to play a coin game. <laughs> I think that's part of it. And I think Ratoon Tycoon was like, let's see if we can get the world to play a train game. Right. All right. I only got two left. So sorry if this is taking longer than I thought it would. I, I think it's been going well. A game called Bequest. This is from WizKids. And this is one I had to put on the list because I think Sean would love it with all of his love of super stuff recently. This is you are playing the Minions splitting up the evil mastermind's loot after he's defeated by the heroes this is a super short filler 30 minutes to play get a hand of cards you then do the split you choose so i have five cards between me and my player on my right i have to split those up so i'm going to say these two go in this pile these three go in this pile at the same time my player on my left is going to do that then the player is going to look at those and pick one of the two piles Oh, I'm going to want the three because there's three of them or do I take the two because they're really good and again you split these cards however you want and I think it's actually a six hand card or it might be five because I don't think you never split it's either five or seven um you're going to switch which way you pass it uses this little splitter board to keep that clear so one turn you pass this way the next turn you pass this way then at the end of the round everyone looks at what they got you put it down in front of you, you play a couple more rounds then you add up your points this is very much sushi go scoring right? You, you get this one's worth sets. This is worth it. If you have sequence, this is worth it. If you have different types and so on. Yeah. Very quirky fun. You get stuff like your cult. There, there's evidence he left behind treasure, uh, minions and, and things. It definitely looks like a fun little, uh, filler, filler game. Yeah. Yeah. To me, this looks like sushi go with a neater theme. Yeah. Finally, I have mythic mischief. And I don't know if it's IV games or four games. I don't know if they're going for the, the, the Roman numerals or not. Um, this is an asymmetric game that is very much based on your popular kids in a wizarding school. Um, you are playing different factions, different houses, uh, getting in trouble in a magical school. Lots of minis, which surprised me from this, with a very small board. Like it's, it's, it's very condensed. Um, it comes with set factions. You can buy more. Uh, which include other houses as well as character types like zombies and, and skeletons and stuff. Uh, there is a solo mode. What the game is actually about is you are in a library trying to collect tomes, magical tomes, that without getting caught by the teachers. So the way the game plays is you play a round before lunch where all your abilities are set and you're trying to grab these things while avoiding this like the, the, this teacher that walks around. Before lunch, the teacher's quick and, and alert. After lunch, the teacher's full and is plotting and slower. And after lunch, your characters unlock new abilities. Um, the, there, there's ways you get points, you level up your powers. It looks like a kind of mix of nuns on the run, ice cool without the flicking, but it has that theme. And um, Harry Potter Hogwarts, the, the house cup competition. You kind of mash up these all together. The thing that shocked me in this is I, I, sorry, there are three main people who do most of the shop and sit down videos, and I can't remember the second main one's name, noted, this is unlike anything we've ever played. That alone, I was like, whoa, like, like the, these are people who have been doing what I'm doing since 2011, have recorded thousands of videos. Man, they've never seen this. It looks light and fun. The miniatures look cool. The only thing that turned me off was all those extra packs. This was very obviously a Kickstarter with lots of stretch goals that unlocked more and more miniatures and powers. I got to admit that turned me off because I didn't back the Kickstarter and go always all in. But this looks like a great alternative to a license you may no longer want to support. Indeed. There's, um, it looks like, so this is based off, and I'm still not actually sure if it's IV or four. Uh, I have actually <laughs> been doing research in the background and I'm still not sure it's, it, they are a breakaway of a, uh, I'm going to call it studio four, uh, animation studio in Nashville okay. who some of the employees decided they wanted to do games like board games as well. And they've been doing cool. uh, major commercial product work for, for ages. Um, this is their uh, fourth game, fourth or fifth game, I think. Okay. Um, so they're not, they're not brand new. 
Uh, they are a Kickstarter game. Oh, sorry, eight. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, there's a whole bunch of expansions for me. <laughs> yeah, Jeff. that's. Um, this seems to be their their biggest Kickstarter to date by a long shot, um, and they they aren't uh, chintzing out on the no. materials at all. Uh, in fact, a lot of people are kind of um, non North Americans are kind of terrified. Uh, or, we're, or we're terrified of shipping and backing and VAT because VAT wasn't included mm-hmm. in the price, mm. and it was like you know ninety pounds. Uh, you know, it, it, again, really nice, but you're paying for that. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of really nice components involved with mm-hmm. it, and uh, nice three D uh, bits. Yeah, and and the theme again. If you don't want to support that person and that uh, thing, this is a really solid option to do it. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if this even ever hits retail. Yeah, I don't know. So, I, I will admit. <laughs> I the I, I watched demos. Demo looked cool. This one, this one, this one I actually watched again an actual play, and they were having a lot of fun. Oh yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's it for our list of games that we're excited about after learning about them at the Shut Up and Sit Down online convention, Aw Shucks Autumn 2021. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website. Click on Ask the Bellhop. 